This was his uh, baby. He felt he had been wronged by the N- by the NBA. This was what he was going to as a great, uh, well known showman and promoter. This was what he was going to challenge the NBA and beat them at their own game. And it was sunk by this by this roguish owner in in Cleveland who uh, went behind his back and uh, made a lot of promises to about a merger and, and, and all of these things and uh, was under finance from the start and managed to get through on a smile and a shoe shine for a long, long, long time. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, as longtime comedian Marty Allen might say, hello there. And uh, my name is Tim Hanlon, and this is uh, Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for joining us here on the uh, the big show. If this is your first time, we appreciate you giving us a try. Uh, if you're a repeat visitor or offender, as we might think, uh, we welcome you back as well. Um, today is actually a, a uh, almost a quick uh, responsive follow-up to an episode we had just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had Murray Nelson on the show. Uh, a few weeks back, talking about the uh, origins uh, of the short-lived American Basketball League of the early 1960s, uh, and in particular, Abe Saperstein, the founder of that league, and his role in all of it. Uh, but today, we're going to be actually coming at it from a different angle uh, by uh, our friend uh, and sports columnist for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Bill Livingston, uh, who wrote a book a couple of years back called George Steinbrenner's Pipe Dream, the ABL Champion Cleveland Pipers. And uh, as we mentioned with our chat with uh, with Murray Nelson, uh, George Steinbrenner and his role in running and owning the Cleveland Pipers uh, really was a very uh, uh, significant uh, part of the ABL's short history. And a matter of fact, uh, many would say uh, that uh, Mr. Steinbrenner, in his early days in running a sports franchise, uh, soon to be uh, fully uh, in view when he owned and ran the New York Yankees, uh, in many respects, uh, uh, kind of led to the uh, the demise of the ABL perhaps sooner than uh, than uh, than expected, and certainly not uh, in the mind of uh, Abe Saperstein, who had uh, bigger ambitions. But uh, the role of George Steinbrenner, uh, the American Basketball League, and and the shenanigans you could argue uh, that brought about the collapse of the league and uh, and what was to come afterwards uh, is uh, is very much uh, the uh, the set of conversation that we'll be having uh, in just a couple of seconds with our friend Bill Livingston. Uh, here on the show. A uh, quick reminder that uh, Audible, again, is our sponsor today. And uh, we encourage you, please, to give us a try, give us a try, give Audible a try, uh, and get a free audiobook download uh, and a free 30 day uh, trial of Audible's audiobook service. Uh, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats to get your free audiobook download. And there are over 180,000 uh, titles to choose from. So there's there's no excuse to not try something. Uh, doesn't have to be in sports history. It could be in, you know, romance or comedy or sci-fi or business, maybe like a good thriller. I don't know, whatever you're into, just give it a try, right? Give the whole service a try, a free audiobook download. It's going to be a couple of hours worth your time. Uh, you're going to love it as much as I do. You can cancel at any time. Uh, it's audibletrial.com slash good seats uh, to, uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, and by the way, by doing so, you'll be, uh, You'll be giving a little love to our little podcast here, and we could always use a little love once in a while, your ratings, your reviews, but a little coin once in a while from some of our uh, promotional partners, uh, giving them a try, certainly encouraged as well. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day trial and your free audiobook download. I love Audible. You should love Audible. Let's all love Audible together, shall we? Okay. Uh, that's it for my promotional spiel. And, uh, think now we should segue, shouldn't we? Yes, let's do so. Our conversation, our chat, our very interesting dialogue with Bill Livingston. We're going to talk about the ABL, George Steinbrenner, and the champion of that league, that one-year champion of the Cleveland Pipers here on the podcast. I guess, uh, I'd love to kind of just get a sense of how you even got interested in the topic. Uh, obviously, you've been a sports columnist uh, yeah, with the Cleveland Plain Dealer for some time, but I suspect that the uh, interest around this story didn't necessarily emanate from uh, from your day-to-day, or maybe it did. No, it actually, I was approached about uh, doing a book on it by a, by a friend uh, who had recommended me to his agent. And um, I had hoped to sell it to a, a New York publisher, 
and they they actually liked it at one of the houses, but marketing decided that it didn't have enough of a Steinbrenner tag for New York, and they didn't think it would uh, sell the 20,000 books that they're looking to sell nowadays, especially with a person who, uh, you know, I've, I've written two books, but they were both basically local books. So I, uh, I, I kind of, I'd done a month's work of um, interviewing on it and some research, and I put it aside for a while, and, and my wife said, well, you know, what are you going to do about the Piper's book? It, you know, you, you really ought to look into trying to finish it. Maybe it'll lead to something else. And you'd said that, that it was a very interesting topic and a neglected part of sports history. And the more I thought about it, the more she was right. Uh, I realized she was right, which is not uh, hardly the first time that's happened to me and her. And so I, I started doing it again. And um, it would have been a hell of a book five years ago before Larry Siegfried died and some of the other people died. But it's still a heck of a read uh, because the story's just so, so amazing. It really, uh, you know, I just became, as I went through the microfilm of the Plain Dealer and the Cleveland Press, and read the day-to-day -day coverage. The fact that it, first of all, the fact that it was Steinbrenner's first professional sports uh, venture, but just the um, the incredible ups and downs and twists and turns and the, the the blustering lies he told to try to keep the franchise afloat and and you know that they almost got into the NBA on a, on a shoestring and 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 a bunch of uh, promises by George. Well, let's maybe we should uh, back up a little bit and sort of get a sense of how George Steinbrenner, then the scion of a Cleveland uh, industrial magnate, uh, got involved in basketball in the first place, let alone this fledgling franchise in this fledgling league. Okay, sure. He was um, he wasn't interested in taking over the Great Lakes sh shipping business. It was called Kinsman Shipping. Um, it was basically the Steinbrenner business, though. Um, and his father was wanted him to become uh, the, the head of the shipping, his father, Henry. They're all named Henry or George. It just goes, and George, the George Steinbrenner we know is George the Third, like like the king. And, you know, it was, uh, I guess there will eventually maybe be a George the Fourth, but you, you can't really plan on it like uh, like you did World Wars, uh, you know. But, but it was, that's how it was, they were, they were enumer enumerated. And uh, so George uh, was a had been the Ohio Chamber of Commerce Man of the Year and was a wheeler and dealer in Cleveland and was always interested in sports. And he wanted to make his reputation in a different business front than shipping. And the NIBL, which was uh, the National Industrial Basketball League, had a Cleveland franchise, and it had the first black coach of a uh, integrated team in, uh, in professional sports, uh, basketball, certainly. John McClendon, who was from Tennessee State, was Tennessee A&I then, and had been a small college power with three straight NAI championships. And there was a new league starting up. Um, it all began with Abe Saperstein, the owner of the, of the Harlem Globetrotters, who thought he had been promised the L.A. market by the NBA commissioner, Maurice Podoloff. And when the Minneapolis Lakers moved, Bob Short moved them uh, and invaded that market. Um, Saperstein felt he had been double-crossed, although he had already put out, as Murray Nelson pointed out in his book about the American Basketball League, he had already uh, tried, started uh, putting out feelers to owners about starting a, a, a rival league. And this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, and he then launched the a ABL. And uh, George was the front man and the, the chief owner of a group of uh, 20 or so young guys in Cleveland, all all uh, the next generation of prominent families like the Stouffer Frozen Food Company, uh, who, who invested in the pro basketball team. And uh, his father was adamantly opposed to it and felt that it was foolish to be throwing money at a, at a sports enterprise. So that's how it started. Um, so we uh, we talked with uh, Murray, actually. It's our current episode that's out uh, this week as we're recording it. Uh, so we got a little bit of, uh, of sort of the Saperstein background uh, on this. And it, it piqued my interest even further, obviously, with this particular part, because Steinbrenner, obviously, what became, you know, uh, frankly, a, a pivotal, uh, you know, person in, in the short history and maybe the reason why it was a short history of the ABL. But before we go a little bit further there, I, I, maybe our audience could benefit from the 
from the understanding that this 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 idea of industrial basketball right was a was a real thing and a very solid thing and and uh, 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 sure. be an amateur but not really fully amateur right no it was uh it was a mid step it was a mid pro midway step between college and 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 the n b a these guys were uh, Bob Curland, who had been a, a, a great player at Oklahoma A and M, now Oklahoma State, was with the Phillips Sixty Sixers. It was large companies that, that fielded company teams, and they had <clears throat> they had jobs with the company. <clears throat> Excuse me. And many players felt that you know they, they would have an off season job, and it was also preparation for a business career. And there were some there were some very good players who who were in the NIBL, and. Um, you know, all, at, at sometimes in the before uh, in the 40s, I think they had uh, the Olympic team. Sometimes was composed of a lot of NIBL players. And in fact, when uh, when the Pipers were still an NIBL team after after the Pipers won the uh, the AAU championship, they went to the Soviet Union, uh, the first American team to tour there. Uh, and and it was mostly NIBL players, and most of them were many of them were Pipers. And John McClendon uh, took them over because that was considered to be a big uh, propaganda statement that we would have a America would have an African American coach leading this this basketball team. Sure. Um, so, but so, give me some sense then of how how Steinbrenner uh, and his group of owners uh, made the jump into, I guess, a fledgling professional league. I I got the sense that it wasn't necessarily his. His idea alone, uh, he might have been sort of, uh, I don't know, coerced and or maybe intrigued to, to jump into the professional ranks. He was, yeah, he was intrigued to make his own way and make his own name. And uh, the team, yeah, it was very cheap. Uh, the team was called the Pipers because they were the first owner was, uh, owned the plumbing company. It wasn't the little bagpiper with the Tam O'Shanter on his head. It was a, it was an industrial company. And they they were they were flat broke. He he got it for like I think twenty five thousand dollars or something that, and he certainly didn't put up all of it that he and his other investors put together. And he was not thrilled at having John McClendon as the coach because he John McClendon was a soft spoken guy. George was by all accounts not a racist at all, but he wanted a big name. He wanted to make a splash in the papers, and and John McClendon was was not going to do that for him, even though. He was a racial pioneer in Cleveland, the city of racial pioneers, with Larry Doby and Frank Robinson, the first African American manager, and Bill Willis and Marion Motley with the Browns, and and, and you know Lenny Wilkins for that matter, and, and Wayne Embry, the first uh, African American front office really in the NBA. But uh, George took over the team, and, and it was a few weeks before he decided that he would keep McClendon as his coach, and. Um, when he took over the team, they went to the AAU tournament, and even though they had the, the best record, the tournament was played in Denver because the attendance would be better. And um, they won they won a couple of games and got to the finals. And George wanted to bring them home because the hotel bills were running too high, even though they were they were sleeping to, to a room, and uh, not in not in the Ritz Carlton, uh, whatever that might have been of its day, the Brown Palace or something, I guess. And um, John McClendon had to go to a friendly banker in Detroit, uh, Detroit in Denver, and and get a loan for the money that enabled them to stay for the final game, which they won. And they were the, they were the first Ohio team ever to win an AA national championship. And after that, the, the team was a winning team, so he pretty much had to hire, he had to keep McClendon on as his coach as they went into this new venture, the ABL. So what was the relationship between uh, Steinbrenner and Saperstein, right? Because obviously Saperstein was the, the main engine, I guess, behind creating this new league. And then it seems like that Steinbrenner would have to be somewhat impressed or, uh, you know, uh, convinced by somebody like Saperstein to, to say yes and to join in. Well, to some extent, but George Steinbrenner pretty much went rogue early. Um, he conducted business in his own way and and quickly ran afoul of the uh, of the of the league office but the league was in such financial straits uh that there wasn't a whole lot they could do about him uh, they were almost expelled in mid-season for not turning over the share of the gate receipts that they were supposed to give to the league and for uh playing in, in they played all over the area it was like the regionalization of the of the early aba teams like the carolina cougars they played in columbus many suburbs of cleveland as far away as uh, 
they, uh, as far away as Sandusky and Youngstown, uh, and and again in the seven county metropolitan area, and, and at some high school gyms. And um, George kind of did his own deal with with Saperstein. Saperstein apparently was a very weak and vacillating commissioner who uh, he owned the Chicago majors and ran them as a de facto Globetrotters farm team. Uh, he just shuffled players between the Globetrotters, whom, whom he owned, and 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 the majors. If uh, if a Globetrotter looked good, he'd bring him up to the to the ABL team. In fact, they played at the uh, at Chicago Stadium, not the NBA expansion team, because the Globies were such a big draw in those days. The NBA team, the pa- the Packers were originally the NBA team, followed by the Zephyrs and then the Bulls. Uh, had to play at the International Theater uh, Amphitheater out in the Stockyards area, um, and and so you know he uh, he was pretty much a rogue owner all the way. Um, there were all sorts of disputes that we can get into later with the about the league office and, and George. Well, sure. So w- why were they so peripatetic in the in the Cleveland region? Was it because they couldn't find a place to st- play on a regular basis? Or no, they, they did it everywhere, ones? really. Um, what they were well, they wanted to try to you know popularize it around the area, but uh, it was one, part of Saperstein's vision was to play games either at at a league city or at a neutral site and play double headers, and they would also play series of games to cut down tra- uh, travel. So they you know there was a team in Hawaii, so you went to Hawaii one time, played three or four games out there, and teams very seldom won in Hawaii uh, because of the travel, because of the you know, attractions. And according to uh, Mike, the late Mike Cleary, who was the first general manager of the Pipers and the first guy ever fired in pro sports by Steinbrenner um, and later became the uh, the GM of the arch rival Kansas City Steers. It was because the, um, the, the referees were based out there. They didn't travel and um, they were of Japanese descent. And uh, he thought that uh, if, the, if, if the Hawaii Chiefs didn't win, they might be on the next trip uh, boat to Yokohama or something. But they had a tremendous home court record, the Hawaii team. Uh, you know, they played a lot of doubleheaders in Pittsburgh, uh, which, you know, th- this, was not a, this, this was not a league. There are a lot of, you know, leagues that came and win and that are good, colorful stories. But the difference with the ABL besides the three-point shot is that there were big names in the league. Connie Hawkins was the – he was the first LeBron. He was the MVP of the league at 19 after he had to leave the University of Iowa, probably innocent of of, 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 of uh, point-shaving charges. And uh, there were – Bill Spivey, who had been caught up in the Kentucky scandal, was played in the league with uh, – eventually with uh, Hawaii. And uh, there was Tony Jackson of uh, played in the league and made 12 three-pointers. In 1961-62, in one game, which is still, would be the record in the NBA, and it was 25 foot shot, which was one foot three inches deeper than uh, than it is in the NBA. So, the, yeah, and actually, a thing that I did that I um, researched, the first full and the only full year of the ABO, they shot the they shot the three pointer a deeper three than the NBA one, and as deep as the ABA one at a higher success rate than, than the NBA or ABA did in their first years. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, I went back to Cleveland for a second, though. Why, why, though, within Cleveland did they play in so many arenas? Well, they had arena availability problems. They wanted to play at, at the Cleveland Arena, and uh, it was owned by the owner of the, of the Barons, uh, an international hockey league team, and they had first call on the place, and its nickname was the Ice House. So their backup was, um, was Civic Arena, which uh, C- Civic Hall, which um, uh, that's not its name. I'm trying to I'm, I'm blanking out on it, but it, it's it's still a uh, public hall. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's um, not really a very good basketball arena. It has a stage on it. Uh, it was originally used for it, it was the site of a Republican National Convention. Uh, they had problems with they, there was no. It was difficult to uh, to get to the uh, to get to the ga- games, and uh, basically they they just wanted to try to take it and let people see the product also around the area. They played in Lorraine and Ashtabula and uh, a lot of the a lot of the suburban areas. They they um, 
and, and Columbus, there was some thought that they were going to move the team to Columbus for a while um, because George had a lot of Ohio State ties, and uh, they didn't draw very well in Columbus either. Well, that had to play havoc, though, with, with drawing people to, on a consistent basis to see the games right? because they didn't know where the stadium was. They are going to play the game. No? Not only did they not know where the stadium was, or who, who, sometimes they didn't know who they were playing. Uh, a controversy arose later in the season where they were supposed to be playing, I think it was the San Francisco team, the Saints, and instead they wound up playing um, – Maybe they were supposed to be playing the majors, and wound up, there was a doubleheader, and they played the other team at the doubleheader because San Francisco, we heard, couldn't get there. With the, the papers were first recorded that San Francisco couldn't get there because of bad weather. Well, what it turned out later was George was refusing to go to the West Coast because he was hemorrhaging money, and he wanted to cut out the trips, the costly trips to the West Coast. And San Francisco, L.A. had already folded, the Los Angeles Jets, which was originally coached by Bill Sharman. Um, San Francisco said, then we're not going to go to the Midwest, and they just didn't come. This is the type of rebellion that was going on in the league. The schedule was just a fluid thing that Saperstein made up uh, on the fly. Uh, you know, there were it was, it was not an uncommon thing for the schedule that was listed in the paper that morning to be wrong. That's interesting. So, how, so okay. So let's let's bring it back to Cleveland then, and, and Steinbrenner, right? So, just is is he is he trying to basically take advantage of this craziness and and lack of stability and, and to his advantage uh, already, or is this this is a pattern? He was just trying made? to stay afloat. Okay. He, his father wouldn't let him touch the family money, and uh, he was he was just um, you know promising things and and borrowing money and just just trying to get the league going. And he his goal was always to get out of this as he called it, a Bush League near near the end of the season and, and get into the NBA. And, of course, I don't know how many listeners know this, but they signed Jerry Lucas out of Ohio State, who was the kind of the Larry Bird and Bill Bradley of his day, uh, the greatest white player in the game and, and the greatest scholar athlete in the game. And it was just stunning for this fly-by-night league that, had all, that didn't draw anybody to get the – you know, the most popular player on the on the most publicized team in the country. And that's how they got their NBA invitation that never came across because of they couldn't pay the indemnity payments. But uh, all along, he was looking for a bigger stage. And that's why he wanted a bigger name coach. Well, OK, so let's unpack that for a second, because, you know, in the middle of that first season, right, the shades of of what was to become a very obvious and and renegade George Steinbrenner certainly started to show through, right? Because he ultimately did indeed uh, figure out a way to uh, create or or engender a rift with uh, Coach McClendon to the point where, right. depending on who you ask, McClendon either quit or was fired uh, and right. replaced, right? So what was so what's the story there? It's clear that besides hemorrhaging money and, and trying to watch the, watch the pennies, Steinbrenner was still starting to show meddling uh, interest, I guess, oh, sure. in making yeah. sure the team worked. Yeah, he, he traded a player at halftime to the team they were playing that night. He traded Grady McCollum, a sub, to the Hawaii Chiefs who were playing that night, whom they were playing that night in Cleveland, and wanted him to suit up and play against his teammates in the second half. And a tearful McCollum told uh, John McClendon that, and McClendon was outraged and said, you don't have to do that. Just go sit in the stands. You're not going to have I'm, you're you're not going to have to do anything like that. They had they had a first half playoff and a second half playoff, a, a split season, starting again after the first half playoff. The Pipers had two of the three games at home and managed to lose in three games to Kansas City, losing the third game at home. And George went ballistic, and and as part of part of it was his peak, and uh, just just petty anger at the team that they that they had not won the championship of the first half. And the winner of the first half automatically went to the finals. That was the format. And part of it was he didn't have the money. He refused to pay the players. And this eventually leaked out to Bob Sudik of the press who covered them. And the players were going to boycott. They weren't going to go to a game in Pittsburgh if he didn't pay them because you know, several of them were married and had children or certainly had uh, significant others living with them. Or, or you know, even though they didn't have children, they were married and they had bills to meet. And uh, they uh, there was almost a boycott of, of, of the and, and Steinbrenner eventually gave in and paid them with uh, with a lot of recriminations about that. 
So that sort of infamous uh, mid-game uh, trade and then the reaction of McClendon of that trade, that was that was all predicated from or, or around losing that first half season series. Right. And he also, George also was uh, a guy who, you know, he, 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 he was, uh, didn't want to be loved. He wanted to be feared and respected. And there was a game where the Pipers were playing in Pittsburgh and they were in, you know, they were saving money. It was a two hour drive. Uh, they were in station wagons and, uh, the one that one of them had a flat tire <clears throat> and, uh, Coach McClendon stayed with the stricken vehicle and sent the starters on in, a, in the other one. And by the time they got it fixed and got to the arena, it was the second half. And he had told Jack Adams, who was his point guard, you be, you co- you're the player coach until I get there. And when he got there, they were solidly ahead and they wound up winning the game by about 20 points. So McClendon just sat on the bench and let Adams continue to coach. And Steinbrenner went crazy about that and said, what am I, what am I coaching you for? If you're, what am I paying you for if you're not going to coach? He said, "You want? we won the game. I didn't have to do anything. You know, the, the, we have a good team, and we were winning the game. So McClendon was a guy who, um, you know, they, as um, as someone said uh, who was with the Pittsburgh Wrens, you know, that was marriage made in hell. It was never going to work between a laid-back, diffident, and yet, you know, a core of steel about his personal dignity like John McClendon and a bombastic, temperamental, explosive person like George Steinbrenner. Yeah, but by all accounts, McClendon was a uh, well-regarded, almost revered uh, uh, figure, right? I mean, he, he was largely responsible for Well, he wasn't the big name that George wanted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He was, he, he, uh, his faculty advisor at the University of Kansas was, was Naismith, was James Naismith. He had wanted to go to, uh, to Springfield College, where Naismith had, you know, of course, invented basketball, and his father said, well, he, he's on the faculty at the University of Kansas, and the family, they, they grew up, I think, in the Kansas City area. He said, why don't you go to Kansas? And, and, and McClendon, was, uh, his, his faculty advisor, was, was James Naismith. I mean, it was, it's an incredible thing to what history you were seeing with, George, with, with John McClendon, a man who actually knew and, and was you know, given personal basketball tutelage by Naismith. Well, and 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 ultimately a, a basketball Hall of Famer. Uh, I think he was, in fact, inducted twice. I don't know the circumstances as well yes. as the college basketball. Finally, Hall of Fame, right? finally in as a coach, also. Oh, there he is, a coach. And that was long overdue because the Tennessee State teams were uh, won three straight NAIAs, and um, they were probably as good as um, the top NCAA teams of the era. And McClendon was responsible for, for uh, among other things, uh, bringing in Dick Barnett, right, who was a quite the phenom. Uh, for sure. Him, right? Well, he brought a lot of his Tennessee State players in, and, and Barnett was the best one he ever coached. And Barnett was backed up, uh, wasn't getting playing time in Syracuse. And, you know, he was an African-American man in Syracuse in the, in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. It couldn't, uh, it wasn't a whole lot of social life. And uh, certainly not, not the type of social life you could get on the north side of Nashville at Tennessee State. And, he, um, you know, he he left and, and came to the came to the Pipers, and there was a lawsuit about it. And the the strategy of the lawsuit all the time was to just bleed the ABL owners. Uh, they would eventually set, make a monetary settlement. And uh, you know, had the ABL owners had the pockets of the AFL owners, there well might have been a first merger, and not not wait until the ABA. But they did. They they weren't well financed enough to withstand the court causes that the costs that were thrown at them. So is it fair to say that that most of the owners, despite maybe their, I don't know, their stomachs being maybe larger than their, their eyes being larger than their stomachs or whatever the analogy is, uh, wanted to effectively to challenge and then get into the NBA eventually? Well, the top teams did. Certainly Kansas City wanted to and Pittsburgh wanted to. Pittsburgh had Connie Hawkins. Kansas City had Bill Bridges and, and the best team by far overall. They had the Overall record, they were nine or ten games ahead of the Pipers on the on the season, um, and uh, would have won won both halves of the of the overall standings by you know by a solid margin. Um, but that was you know the the league the the Jets folded early. The Los Angeles Jets that was Charman was the coach and uh, actually the player coach at first. 
it's interesting that he thought uh, he thought the three point line was too deep. It was too deep for him anyway. Uh, and uh, you know, it it just became the incredible shrinking league as as uh, Washington picked up and moved in the middle of the season to, to out on Comac, Long, Long Island. Nobody could find it. You know, it was a, a broken down old place. They played at Uline Arena, which was legendarily a terrible place in the NBA uh, in in the 40s when when that was the host of the home home court of the uh, Washington franchise. And they were, you know, they played in. Um, it was in L.A. They played at the uh, at, at the Olympic, uh, which uh, did not have a standard, didn't have room for a standard size court. It was uh, something like seven feet too short or ten feet too short, something like that. So it was, you know, it was a league that kind of like the early AB, AFL teams that remember Frank Ewell Field where the where the leg, where the uh, Raiders played, which was a high school stadium. That's kind of what some of the franchisers were like in the ABL. That's uh, it's that's the I mean uh, you wonder in the in the in the age of video that we live in today if you had some some footage some footage of that I it's 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 kind of hard to sort of frame even in, in my there's mind. one small clip that I found and the, I it's the only proof that I ever found that the Pipers lived in uh, it's a shot of them in the small tiny locker room after they won the fifth and final game of the end of season playoffs in Kansas city it was played at a college gym because the uh, municipal auditorium was being taken by the ice capades. And uh, I I'm pretty sure it's Barnett standing on a bench, holding literally a pipe, a steam pipe that was, you know, running through the little locker room to steady himself and pouring champagne over a teammate's head. It's about 15 seconds long. I got to find that. All right, so let's back up to McClendon. So let's clear up the McClendon story. So did he quit or was he fired or what? Then as far as you know. He quit and then was given a face-saving job as a uh, kind of a public, not a public relations man, kind of a community relations guy to go around and make speeches about basketball and about the Pipers. One of the real kind of sad stories I thought that happened was uh, at that time, <clears throat> NFL players, nobody was worth the money that they're worth today. NFL teams had off-season basketball teams. And Jim Brown was a very good basketball player, along with a Hall of Famer, of course, in football and in lacrosse. And he was the big draw of, a, of, of the Browns off-season team. They were playing the Steelers in a game at the, at the uh, Cleveland Arena. And the usual thing would be if the Globies were, were if the Globetrotters were the first game, half the attendance would leave after the Globetrotters game. They didn't uh, rather than watch the ABL game. And the Browns, the, the NFL teams, you know, football players playing basketball, had nearly the same effect. Well, when they're coming in, he's now got McClendon. Uh, he's got Charmin as his coach. He's got McClendon as a community affairs guy. He has McClendon coach the Browns. Uh, the Browns team in a game where uh, one of the Steelers wore a slouch hat during the game. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, not globe trotter type antics, but there was a, a lot of razzing of the Steelers. And, and it was just kind of, it was kind of a sad thing to think of a man who had done as much as he had done as John McClendon had done in basketball uh, and this great racial pioneer to be reduced to coaching in this kind of charade of a basketball game because he was still, uh, you know, Steinbrenner still could tell him what to do. Well, okay. Uh, so with McClendon basically on the sidelines, uh, figuratively and literally, uh, why Bill Sharman of the now folded L.A. Jets? What was so magic about him and why did Steinbrenner insist on getting him as the coach to, for the rest of the season? Well, he was a big name and uh, George had heard good things about him. Uh, George didn't know a George didn't really know a whole lot about basketball. He was very excited to have signed Larry Siegfried. He was the only NCAA player of any note who, who came to the Pipers. And uh, Siegfried was a defensive player. Uh, with Boston, he was a, a stopper, in the uh, you know, backcourt stopper, not a flashy, flamboyant, high-scoring player at all. But he didn't know about Bill Sharman, and he knew uh, Bill Sharman had a big name. He George liked baseball. He had been a part-time baseball coach at Lackland, at, at a, a Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, uh, where they played the Ohio State freshman and got tattooed. 
And uh, he knew a lot about baseball. And, and Charman had also been uh, with the Dodgers. He, I don't think he ever had a net bat, but he was on the roster called up in, in September. And, uh, and so he, Steinbrenner, he became available. And, you know, somehow Bill moved over here and uh, put in a, a lot of the things that became standard in the, in the NBA, the, the game day shoot around and, uh, you know, he was a big proponent of uh, of conditioning and visualization of success, and he was way ahead of his time in those ways. And I made some lineup changes, and you know, the, the, they were two and seven in the second half when he took over, and you know, they wound up winning the whole thing. So it was the right move to make, possibly just because it he had so much big name credibility, and, and from his playing career too, George respected that. That compared to McClendon, George left him alone. I mean, he didn't uh, he didn't second guess him as much. He didn't barge into the locker room at halftime. Uh, it was a much more sedate operation with uh, with a guy like Charman running the show as coach. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The 10 Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I look too at the, uh, at the stats, right, at the uh, actual ABA finals, the actual final uh, series. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily uh, a, a clear shot there either because uh, uh, Cleveland lost the first two games to Kansas City in that Big. series. Lost them big. It, it reminded me of the Cavs come back against the Warriors last last year when they lost the first two games by 48 points combined. Um, yeah, they, they lost big, and they won two buzzer beaters here. Uh, they won on a Dick Barnett hook shot uh, at the buzzer and on a Connie Durking jump shot. Or No, Durking was a hook shot, and they called Barnett's a hook shot, but I'm told that it was this usual kind of you know, contorted fallback jumper deep from the corner. It might have been a three-pointer nowadays. So, uh, oh, well, I guess they, I guess it wasn't because they did have the corner three. I guess it was just a deep two. But, um, yeah, and they, they went back out there after uh, – uh, that's a whole story, too. They almost forfeited the final game of the of the, of the ABL finals. Uh, we can get into that <laughs> later well, on, yeah. or I can so talk let, about let, it now. Yeah, let's to. let's set the let's set the tone. So, just to put this in context to, for our audience, I mean, um, I'm looking at the stats here. Uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, first finals that uh, uh, the Steers of Kansas City and, and the Cleveland Pipers played. I mean, it was uh, it was basically every other day from April 1st all the way to April 9th. So basically, one day uh, break. And Kansas City uh, paced at Cleveland by 25 in the first game on April 1st, uh, 1962. And uh, it looks mm-hmm. like they won. Uh, Kansas City did by wow, twenty thirty. Well, the Cavs had also uh, the Cavs. The like Pipers had also had to survive a sudden death tournament to get to the ABL finals. Um, every team that was the, the there were seven teams left, and six of them went into uh, a series of sudden death games. 
and the the uh, the Pipers had to win two of them. They they beat San Francisco against whom they did not have a very good record, and then they beat I think it was New York in the in the second game and and had to play like the next night at the start of the finals, and they were you they could not get into um they could not get into the the arena the municipal auditorium in Kansas City. So they played at Mason Halpin Fieldhouse. Um, it's uh, on a small college campus, uh, Brockhurst College in uh, in uh, the Chicago area. And um, in the Kansas City area, I'm sorry. And uh, apparently there was no one there, including Steinbrenner, except Piper's players, McClendon, and Charmin. Uh, everyone else was Kansas City fans. But George, before they, they wanted to play in the game, George said that he had been told that he had been promised by Saperstein, and there's no proof of this. It's just his word that uh, the uh, championship game would be played at the East, uh, East Division's winner. Well, that's kind of spurious because the East Division was not guaranteed a spot in the finals once this sudden death thing came up. I mean, it could have been San Francisco against. Kansas City, and there is no East Division team. And Kansas City, you know, rightfully, I think, said, well, you had two of the three games in the first half playoff at your place. You know, uh, we have the best record. It's only right that we have home court. And Steinbrenner said that they then would not go, that they would forfeit the game. He said, uh, uh, and Kansas City had booked uh, flights for them, seats on a flight to Kansas City, and the Pipers canceled them. And there was no game the day that it was scheduled. And Saperstein finally belatedly got involved, and um, this was considered proof of what a weak commissioner he was. He finally sent a telegram and said he settled the dispute in the traditional sporting gesture of flipping a coin, and Kansas City had won, so the game would be played in Kansas City. And George left it up to the players, who, of course, wanted to play. And they, Oh, and at one time, Saperstein also uh, offered a co-championship. Kansas City and the, and the Steers, the Steers and the Pipers could be co-champions, and both teams indignantly turned that down. Certainly, Kansas City did because they were ahead at the time, two games to one. So they they wound up playing the game out in Kansas City with a place that seats about three thousand, and uh, I guess it was three thousand or so was the attendance, and it, apparently it was a, close to a thousand over what everyone reasonably thought the capacity could be, almost all for the uh, for the Steers. And the Pipers won 106 to 102. So they won two buzzer beaters in a close game and, and were champions. Well, so to uh, Steinbrenner's delight, right, a uh, an actual championship. But it didn't seem like uh, that was uh, long lived because, uh, you know, pretty soon thereafter, or was it before they're winning the championship that the whole machinations with Jerry Lucas and the eye oh, on the NBA sort of. Well, I, at first they had they had, they had their they they were almost expelled. There was the expulsion meeting about not meeting uh, with the you know not having uh, reported the uh, gate and not having turned over the league share of the gate, not playing in big enough arenas, not wanting to go to the West Coast, openly flirting with the NBA, uh, which it turns out a lot of things did. I mean, in Julius Irving's. Auto, uh, bio, in uh, Julius Serving's biography, he says, I found out the Nets had been negotiating with the NBA all along. I didn't even know it was legal to talk to the other league if you were in the ABA. Well, you know, the Pipers were doing that long before then. But they, uh, you know, after they won, he knew that they were not going to, they were not going to succeed in this, uh, in this league that was really crumbling before everyone's eyes. And he said, uh, we're putting all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, we, we're going to try to sign Jerry Lucas. And everyone laughed. And he said, uh, if, if we sign Lucas, we can play in a church league and, and sell out the house. How did, he, how did Steinbrenner convince Lucas to uh, make, a, make a, a bolt, I guess, for not even an ABL game or team, right? It, it, how did he convince them to do it? Well, no, they were at the time they were still going to play another ABL season, but the goal was always to try to get an NBA um, invitation and just jilt the ABL. Well, he he, he was very canny about it. Uh, Lucas had said all along, many many times, that he was not going to play pro basketball. That he didn't want to live his life in a suitcase, out of a suitcase. That uh, you know he was a Phi Beta Kappa, 
in, in the School of Commerce. It, those aren't the Greek letters. There's some other ones for the for commerce, but the equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa. Extremely bright guy, uh, very serious young man, a great representative at the Olympics. So, you know, the most popular guy would be mobbed by a player, by fans in Rome after games in 1960. And uh, and he had been on that NIBL team that McClendon coached in in, in Soviet Union, as a, a couple of collegians were there. And Lucas was was the big name. Lucas, uh, they got him by uh, Cincinnati, offered him three years for a hundred thousand dollars, and Steinbrenner just snorted at that and said, "You won't get this guy. You won't get this boy with money." And what they did was they offered him a portfolio of stock options which turned out to be worthless, uh, a position in the future with the shipbuilding company or with other businesses that they would connect him with in Cleveland. And basically they, they pitched a, uh, a business career to him and life after basketball. And, and it was only for two years, not three years that they signed him. And uh, then he could, uh, you know, assess, assess how he liked it. And they had also promised him that it would be a shorter season because he was already troubled by his by his knees and uh that that's how they got him it was what he was looking for uh they showed him that they had lost one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in in 1962 money and he wasn't phased and uh, took their offer and and what happened as a result of that can you give our listeners a sense of of, of what what kind of uh ripple, oh it was ripples it that was caused like a bombshell i mean lucas had played golf with the Cincinnati Royals, who had his NBA rights the day before, and didn't say anything to them uh, that he was meeting with the Pipers the next day to sign. Didn't give them any indication whatsoever. And the general manager of the of the Royals said, uh, "It was like Pearl Harbor. Here he is smiling at us, and and uh, you know we're getting bombed. The next day we find we're getting bombed. You know, and uh, he said, I don't think Lucas is the all American boy he he presents himself to be." And Lucas was a uh, was the kind of guy who kind of told people what they wanted to hear. He, he discerned what their uh, expectations were and was willing to string them along, if uh, uh, to some extent. And he, you know, George was considered uh, Steinbrenner was considered just the, the magic man in Cleveland. I mean, he had been mercilessly and, and fairly ripped for the way he behaved as owner, and now he was the toast of the town. And there was a big piece by Arthur Daly in the in the New York times uh, talking about this miracle that the only reason that they, they got into the NBA and it was by a six, three vote, which was the, the minimum you, you had to have a two thirds approval. They needed a 10th team to balance the schedule because one team was always idle and uh, they, they squeaked in, in the vote. And it was solely because of Lucas, uh, the, the box of office appeal of this in a sport that was becoming more and more black this white player, uh, the great white hope out of Ohio State, you know, the Buckeye boy from a small town, middle town between Dayton and, and Cincinnati, who had led the Buckeyes to three championship games and one national championship and probably would have won another one, except he was he was hurt in the third one. Uh, you know, it was um, again, it was it was kind of like. Uh, a world football league team or something signing uh you know, O.J. Simpson or something right out of college. It was just un- nobody could believe it. All this stuff repeats itself is another theme we sort of see in this uh, in this podcast as we as we go on in the weeks and months ahead. It's uh, this seems like it's history repeating itself over and over and over again. Um, so, all right. So, but let, back up though. I, I'm I'm still fuzzy on. So Lucas gets signed. And the intention is to play in the ABL, or they decide not to. And that's what they were saying publicly. That's what they were saying publicly. But what was going on behind the scenes then? Yeah, and then um, you know the George said that Luca that that Saperstein had given him carte blanche. That was the term he used to negotiate for basically for a merger with the uh, with the NBA. And uh, Murray Nelson's book says that Saperstein said that, that that Saperstein said he, Saperstein, had that, had the carte blanche. But that quote appears in in the Plain Dealer uh, in contemporaneous coverage with Steinbrenner asserting that he had, uh, after, after, you know, the offer came out that he had been given carte blanche by Saperstein to negotiate mainly for the Pipers, but also with the view of a, of a uh, more, of a wider merger. 
Um, and I think it was six weeks or something like that before they, uh, after, after they got Lucas that they were invited into the NBA by the 6-3 vote. So Saperstein must have been devastated and then angered. Oh, he went crazy. He went crazy. He, uh, he sent, he was in Japan or something. He sent, and people knew that he was a, the NBA people knew that he was a very litigious guy. And he sent the, he sent telegrams warning that there would be legal action. And, uh, he came back and, uh, got the other ABL owners to, uh, to, uh, commit to having another season. And he was fully prepared to, to sue their pants off, you know, and, and the NBA, again, they didn't, have, this wasn't the burgeoning sport of pro football that was just rocketing, uh, past baseball in those years are, are starting to move past baseball. Certainly, uh, with Unitas and player, the, the over sudden death overtime game and all of that. Uh, this was not the new American craze. It was still, it was still just basketball, which was nothing like it is now. Ohio State was uh, was the most popular team probably in the country, uh, counting pros, and they were not on TV until March. Was their first televised game for an undefeated team? Their uh, their Lucas's junior year. It's just unimaginable now. When when they won the national championship, when Lucas was a sophomore. They got back at the Cow Palace. They got back into San Francisco at their hotel, and there was nothing to eat at the hotel. They went out looking for some place where they could get something to eat, and they found a bar and grill that was about to close up. And Siegfried was the oldest player and the captain of the team and the leader. And he told the owner, he said, well, you got, could you just let us in because we just won the national championship? And the owner said, of what? You know, there was no te- Final Four telecast then or, or any. It was just – it was the the uh, Cavaliers had had West and Robertson at a Black History Month thing about 15 years ago, and I've they both agreed. West said it, but Oscar totally agreed. West said when we played in the NBA, it, it was a minor league that that presented itself as a major league, but it was a minor league, and that's you know the ABL was even bushier bushier league. That's I, that's that's very that's that all right. So where so so the sign Lucas the 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 entreaty by the NBA occurs. They're basically accepted, and they get to do nothing for the season. Well, because they couldn't meet the indemnity payments uh, to, to to the entrance fees and the payments to the Royals for infringing on the Ohio market. Although it's two hundred fifty miles away down on the Ohio River, and Cleveland's up on Lake Erie. Um, they, Steinbrenner lied about that he had paid, uh, all along and it came out, the, the Royals said, uh, charged that he, you know, they had missed all their payments and they showed a, they showed a bounce check that, uh, payment to a uh, player that they're $3,000 and there wasn't enough money in the till for that. When Mike Cleary was the general manager, uh, he said the, the bank where that, that cashed the checks was in the same building as their offices. And he said, when those checks came up, he said, I ran downstairs and I got my money because I knew there wasn't enough in that till for everybody. <laughs> so, you know, they uh, they had a they had a meeting in New York at the Roosevelt Hotel, and um, it, on a on a nine zero vote, the the offer was rescinded on in, in insufficient funds, and there was an attempt by by some other groups in Cleveland to buy in or take over the franchise and try to save it. But George wasn't going to give it up. And uh, he never had, he never could produce proof that he had the backing. So that was, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the way it went. Where, where did the, uh, where did the Kansas city steers come into this? Cause I, there was a, some kind of merger effort. Was that sort of part of the, the yes, game? yes, there was a, this was a, another thing that Steinbrenner did behind uh Behind Saperstein's back, basically, and Cleary and uh, and um, a couple of one, one other source uh, with the with the Wrens uh, confirmed it that there was um, a plan to uh, take the best players from from the uh, Kansas City team and the Cleveland team and kind of with Lucas and and that would have been you know an early super team. Uh, Lucas was Lucas signed a a contract only with the ABL and, and um, when, when that became void with the, with the Pipers uh, being, when the Pipers folded, he was a free agent. He was the first actual free agent 
Um, you know, the NBA was throwing all kinds of money at him to get him to sign. But they they just um, uh, I think it was going to be Bill Bridges was going to play there, and uh, uh, Gene Tremolin, Bumper Tremolin was going to be part of the merger. And um, uh, it's it's in the book. I can't remember. Those were the uh, Bridges was easily their best player, but uh, yeah, this too was just uh, too little, too late. So in essence, Steinbrenner boxed himself into a corner. He played the game, lost it with the NBA. Obviously, had already backed out and was certainly not going to go back to the ABL. Uh, so that pretty much kind of ended his pursuit. Then I guess right. Right. He had tried to enlist the San Francisco Saints owner. And uh, this guy kind of played him along and then backed out at the last second. And, and that was kind of really the, the death knell that, that he just wasn't going to be able to turn up the money after that. Uh, but he, you know, he, uh, he tried to, uh, he did the right thing by his investors. He took an entire ore ship and turned the profits for however many months it took to repay their money. He took the profits from that and repaid all of his investors, which restored his good name in, in the business circles in the, in, in the city of Cleveland anyway. And there's a story, a, a guy that uh, uh, Tony Tomzik, who was the guy that Albert Bell threw the baseball at, the Sports Illustrated photographer. Uh, you're in, yeah, in 1995, uh, fired a ball from the outfield at him when he was taking long range shots of him for a cover story. Tony was uh, had been in uh, had been signed uh, by Steinbrenner to to do glossies for the team before the season opened and uh, the Berlin Wall went up and Tony was in the uh, Army Reserve and was called back to active duty and uh, he never got paid he was he, he was offered two he was promised two hundred and fifty dollars and when he was discharged he came back and marched in blew right past the secretary marched into George's office and started reading him the Riot Act and saying. I was serving my country and you can't pay me the crummy $250 you promised me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And Steinbrenner said, the check is is in the mail. And he said, oh, that's what you always say. And he stormed out. And he said later that week, he got a check from, he got a letter in the mail from Steinbrenner and he opened it up and it was for $500. Double what he had promised him. George always did these type of things. Apparently he, he did terrible, thoughtless, impulsive things to people and tried to throw money at them to fix it. He had some, you know, he certainly was not an amoral man with no conscience. He did have second thoughts. And and I guess so. So how did this play out against the schedule of the ABL? So when was this rescindment, if that's the word? Well, now they were down to, um, first of all, they were, back in the expulsion uh, hearings, there was no way they were going to expel them because they were down to seven teams. Then they, you didn't want to have a, you know, the league to continue to shrink. So they, they, they limped into the season and um, the league folded on new year's Eve, uh, 1962. Yeah. 1962. And the uh, steers were, were uh, proclaimed by Saperstein champions of the second season. In fact, I have seen uh, the late Mike Cleary had a, had a little ring that uh, he said we probably got it for about $35 back then, which, you know, $35 back then was, I don't know how much, but it was a lot more than $35. But it had the uh, University of Texas Longhorn head on the side, and it said uh, ABL champions 1962-63 Kansas City Steers, and they had gotten permission from the University of Texas to use the logo. Interesting. So but when during that ABL season did this, the Steinbrenner – uh, saga play out. Where was the league? Was the ABL playing, and this sort of played out? Or yeah, yeah, they, he, yeah. They didn't even. See, he, he was he was done by late August, and the league started up. And uh, you know, the it was some funny stuff about uh, you know, uh, the, the NBA knew <clears throat> that this league wasn't going to make it. Now, I mean, it was just uh, they they did crazy stuff. Like there was a proposal to play two 30 minute games instead of one 48 minute game. And they tried it one time and it and took a poll of fans afterwards and nobody liked it. So they didn't do it again, but they were just trying everything to, you know, they had a, they had a prize fight bell that would ring when anybody made a three point shot. Cause it was, it was like the knockout shot or something. And uh, they promoted it like it was a home run in baseball. They, they, uh, there was a game in um, where the, our back was there and uh, you know it was just like vultures coming over uh you know uh 
a herd of cattle in the desert that were dying and they were all scouting and um a fight broke out and i'm trying to i right now i can't think of the name of the player but uh this player ran to the bench and uh wrapped his arm in a wrapped his shooting hand in a couple of towels and went back and started punching people it, it wasn't his first rodeo he had done this before <laughs> he didn't he didn't want to hurt his shooting hand because nba scouts were there to to see what you know to evaluate talent and maybe he would get a job so um okay so uh, at the at the end of all of this and i'm still trying to get and and i couldn't sort of get this from murray nelson and and i still haven't really heard it from you i i i'm wondering what the what the level of uh friction and or animosity might have been between Messrs. Saperstein and Steinbrenner. Um, Because I can't imagine it was nothing, given all this. Oh, I think it was pronounced. Uh, It's just that the stories that I read, you know, they're all dead. That I read didn't didn't have anything from Saperstein about it. But I'm, yeah, I mean, you know, this was, this was his uh, baby. He felt he had been wrong by the end, by the NBA. This was what he was going to, as a great, uh, well-known showman and promoter. This was what he was going to challenge the NBA and beat them at their own game. And it was sunk by this, by this roguish owner in, in Cleveland who uh, went behind his back and uh, made a lot of promises to about a merger and, and, and all of these things and uh, was under finance from the start and managed to get through on a smile and a shoe shine for a long, long, long time. Why do you think Steinbrenner ostensibly never went back to pro basketball again and, and moved on to things like the Yankees and, and other endeavors? Well, I think baseball was probably his first love anyway. He uh, he had been an assistant football coach at Purdue and Northwestern also. Uh, I think basketball was just what came along in Cleveland as an opportunity. Um, he, uh, he told Sudik uh, – about a year after the team folded that he knew that he was never going to be a guy who would inspire love and affection and players were going to play for him. They would play out of fear of him. And he felt the only way he could succeed was to, uh, he said, everybody's got 10 more cent, 10 more percent to give, no matter what you think you've got 10 more percent that you can give. And he thought by, by goading them. And, and sometimes, you know, he had, if they did well, he was a, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, would give bonuses, which were probably illegal, but, and, or take the team out to dinner and things like that. But, uh, he felt that he could, uh, browbeat and intimidate and threaten to trade and trade people, even at halftime of games and, and, and get the squeeze the most out of them. He didn't want to be loved. He wanted to be feared and respected. And how about Lucas after all of this? Was he? Did he have any hard feelings, or did he kind of presage this? And did he think this was going to? Well, happen he what? signed a personal services contract with uh, the Marks Advertising Agency, which had been uh, uh, one of the team, one of the groups that tried to come in and kind of usurp the Pipers from Steinbrenner and his death throes. Uh, and he got paid regardless. It was one of these contracts. Like if the world ends, he gets paid the next day anyway. And um, he, after all these, all the comments he had made, uh, uh, there was an excellent piece in the press that just listed all the comments Lucas had made about he would never play in Cincinnati because he was just reviled by the Cincinnati fans when he when he went to the ABL and and uh, a columnist in in, in uh, Columbus criticized him for it, uh, you know, saying that if you, you know, we'll never know how good he was because he chose to go to this bush league and he'll league. We know he'll lead the league in points, rebounds, and checks cashed, and, and things such as that. Um, Lucas, you know, eventually wound up going back to Cincinnati, and it was almost like uh, like comments from the current president that one day it's black and the next day it's white. You know, everything was sunshine and daffodils <laughs> with the Royals. Now that he was going to play for them, he had no hard feelings towards Cincinnati, and never meant to say anything detrimental about Cincinnati. It was it's remarkable. He, he, Jerry Lucas was a politician. You know, he would tell you what you wanted to hear. Okay, last question then. Um, legacy in Cleveland, uh, to the extent that there is any. Uh, you know, obviously this league didn't last for very long, and this uh, this episode with the Pipers didn't last uh, even as long as the league it, uh, it did. Uh, it, was there any lasting legacy? Does anybody kind of really remember this, aside from from your writings and, and, and a few others? I mean, obviously the the, the league itself had some – some some legacies like the three-point three point shot, shot was yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. The, 
you know, I don't think anybody thought the three pointer was going to revolutionize basketball to the extent that it has. Um, you know, it, it proved that a teenage guy could be a great success at some level of pro basketball with, with the Hawk. Um, it proved, I guess, that uh, there was a, most of the cities that were in the ABL, with the ex- odd exception of Pittsburgh, uh, wound up getting NBA franchises. Cleveland got one. Um, let me, let me, there were, there were others, um, well, San Francisco, the, the, the Warriors moved out there and, and became the San Francisco Warriors. Um, they didn't have a Denver franchise, but several, there were, there were, uh, Washington got one eventually. Uh, there were Kansas city, Kansas city got, yeah, the Kansas city, uh, Kings, the uh, Royal Rochester moved out there. A lot of those, a lot of those cities wound up getting NBA expansion teams down the road because, I think they had shown that with, you know, with a little better financing, that there was at least some sort of a market for it. And, and, and also the media markets, you know, the television markets for Cleveland was a top 10 television market then. And it's still in the top 20, I think. Um, really, I, I think there's not all that much, although uh, at the very the, the first chapter of the book after the after the introduction, is a quote from Barnett who, who told me, uh, I always say that we won a championship in Cleveland and LeBron James didn't, but nobody remembers the Pipers. Well, when the book came out, I signed a copy and gave that to LeBron after a practice and asked him to read the first. This was the, before the 2015-16 season. And I asked him to read the uh, the italic precede before the first chapter. And he read it and started laughing. And I said, you think you can make that obsolete? And he said, we're going to do our best. And that was the year they came back off the mat from three one to the Warriors to win the championship. So that's great. That's a great. That's a great story. I, I do think though that there are, there are some people out there that that feel that the ABL was the true. Uh, I don't know inspiration. I guess for the ABA later in the decade. Oh, I, I think no question. I think no question about that. With the three pointer and uh, and the um, really this might have been more Steinbrenner than than a lot of people. The emphasis on uh, on colorful players and stars, getting Rick Barry to come over, and uh, you know later on signing David Thompson out of college, and uh, and of course you had this phenomenon of Dr. J. That how did how did he how did he ever wind up at a, a non top school like UMass and play in the Boston market and and still but still be a surprise to people, you know? But they had him and that had been thrown out of uh, Eastern Michigan for fighting and, and things like that. But I think publicizing individual players, uh, the ABA really made, made its bones that way. But I think it kind of probably started with, uh, with wanting Bill Sharman as a coach and, and trying to get Jerry Lucas as a, as a, as a magnet for the box office and, and even getting, uh, you know, Larry Siegfried before that. Right. And, and Abe Saperstein seeing, you know, being rebuffed by trying to get a franchise to move to the West Coast and, and expand into other right. markets. And, and again, it's another theme we right. see. We see with the, with the football. We've seen it with uh, certainly with baseball. We see it over and over and over again, sort of these. There were all, and there were other players, you know, that, that as I said, the, the stars make the league. And, and you know, of, of course, Connie Hawkins was the biggest name. But R.C. Owens played in that league. He only played four or five games. He was he was the roommate of Elgin Baylor at the at Idaho, and he played for an NIBL team that was an AAU champion before he. And he also, of course, the alley oop pass came with him. Whitey Herzog was a um, was a referee in the league before he became a baseball manager. There's a, a Merle Harmon was the voice of the of, of Kansas City. There were just uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of people that became very famous for other things that passed through the ABL. Very 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 interesting. Well, that's another reason why we do these conversations because uh, it's, it's some fascinating stories. And um, I you know I do want to recommend to our listeners uh, our guest has been Bill Livingston. Uh, he's been a longtime uh, sports writer for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and, and other places, uh, and a twice nominated Pulitzer Prize. Uh, uh, Award yes, nominee. I, I covered Dr. J in Philadelphia for five of the six years I was the beat man. And I've covered both tenures of LeBron James as a columnist here. I've been extremely lucky in my basketball writing. Well, the book uh, that uh, Bill wrote, I think it came out a year and a half ago or so. It's called George Steinbrenner's Pipe Dream, the ABL Champion Cleveland Pipers. Uh, it's published by Kent State University Press. 
Uh, it is available wherever good books are sold, including you'll find a link to it on our website when the show goes up, of course. Uh, and Bill, this has been Amazon too. You can get it on Amazon. Amazon again, wherever good books are found. Indeed. Um, yep. Bill, this has been fantastic and fascinating. And I wonder if there are any other, uh, I don't know, forgotten sports uh, projects rattling around the back of your brain uh, as well. Or are you are you are you petered out? Well, I, I did do this book. You know, I, I wanted. You know, I obviously wanted a, wanted a, it to become a big success. But I honestly did have some real altruistic. Uh, motives too i think it's a very neglected part of basketball and cl- history both here and elsewhere with surprisingly big names and and surprisingly visionary rules one other thing that they had they had the old international trapezoidal lane you know um they would have to use adhesive tape to put in the uh the three-point arc and the and the wider lane to prevent guys from camping out you know they they, they were a very visionary league in many ways just didn't have the money. Well, Bill, thank you so much. This has been a tremendous story, and uh, we appreciate your taking time to, to walk us through this uh, this story. And uh, hopefully it'll uh, pique some interest for folks. Maybe you didn't know the story or certainly haven't read your book, and uh, we'll hopefully pick up a copy to do so. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Bill, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, there it is. There's our chat with Bill Livingston, uh, all about uh, George Steinbrenner, all about the ABL uh, fun and uh, frivolity to be had by all. Uh, what a time it must have been. And uh, who could sort of understand sort of the psyche that uh, is and was George Steinbrenner? Uh, it would have been interesting to talk to him while he was uh, still with us uh, to kind of get a sense of what he was thinking truly uh, by getting involved with, uh, with professional basketball uh, via the ABL and, and what he had in mind for Cleveland and, uh, you know, his, his sights on the NBA, why he didn't go back and uh, try to get an NBA franchise after all that stuff in the early 60s with the Pipers. Uh, just just fascinating stuff. And uh, our thanks again to Bill Livingston, uh, who, again, wrote the book George Steinbrenner's Pipe Dream, the ABL champion Cleveland Pipers, uh, is available uh, for purchase. Uh, it's published by Kent State University Press. And uh, wherever book, good books are found or sold, you can uh, find it there. Uh, you can find a link to it on our website. If you just find the episode posted on goodseatsstillavailable.com, you'll find a link to, to the book there. Uh, and, of course, that is uh, the website that uh, you can uh, keep abreast of what's going on with the show in general. Again, that's goodseatsstillavailable.com. Lots to do there. You can send us email, get on our new email newsletter list someday when we publish it for the first time. Uh, all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, follow us on social media. We love that too. Uh, on Twitter, that's at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. You will find us on Facebook. There's a page devoted to the show there. And um, gee, I don't know. Find us on, uh, on iTunes for sure and rate us and review us. Uh, we appreciate that immensely. That helps generate some heat for the show within the iTunes algorithm. Uh, that's not a bad thing either. Anyway, our, our thanks uh, to not only our guest Bill Livingston, but to you for listening to us, uh, and increasingly so uh, as our, uh, our our rankings keep telling us uh, there's clearly a passionate audience for what we do here, uh, and we can't thank you enough for uh, supporting us uh, and uh, and letting us know how you like the show. Uh, until next time, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye bye.